Hello, children of God. Welcome to today's Kingdom Conversation. I'm always blessed, I'm privileged, honored, and I'm highly favored to have another opportunity to come and speak life, hope, inspiration to each of you on this beautiful and marvelous day. So we give God praise and thanks for allowing us this opportunity to come before you again on this day. And today I want to talk about the subject of being comfortable with who you are being comfortable with who you are. I find that in our society today, particularly in our Western society, and it seems to permeate throughout most of the world, is that we're becoming more and more individualistic. We know America was founded on some principles of freedom and liberty, and we call our day of birth the Independence Day and such. And that is kind of the American mindset. And that is infiltrated into the church at large, both in America and abroad, from what I can see. But if you look at the biblical narrative of community, it was quite different than what we see present in our world today. We need to find a way of Expressing our individual preferences, our individual styles, our uniqueness, but we also need to embrace the need and the value of community. Having common unity to support one another in all areas of life, not just in the spiritual arena. And of course, in the spiritual arena, if we just narrow it down to just one set of belief systems, So we look at Christians, for instance, there are thousands of Christian denominations, each with their individual doctrines and beliefs and such, which is fine. But as a holistic people who believe in one Lord, one faith, one baptism, we need to find common unity that's above and beyond our individual preferences, doctrines and such. And that's going to become more and more important in the times that we're living in now. If you listen to some news accounts, there's an economic downturn taking place. Uh, People are struggling with uh, housing, the cost of housing. Uh, uh, Retailers are closing and things like that. So where does the church, not a church, and anybody follow my ministry for any length of time, you know that when I look talk about the church, I'm talking about the church that Jesus founded in Matthew 6, 18, that he says, upon this rock I will build my church. All other congregations that gather in the name of Christ are simply a congregation of the church, I pray. That is the church that Jesus founded. So we have we should have a basis. Oh, I'll say it like this. If you have that type of mindset, you understand the responsibility that we have toward one another, as well as our outreach to those in our local communities to express the love of Christ to them in tangible ways. But when we fall short of doing that, we're like the scripture that says, But if salt has lost its saltiness, what good is it except to be trampled under the foot of man? And I'm afraid that in in most cases, that is the condition or the relationship between what we call the world and the church. The world seems to have more influence over the church than the church has an influence over the world. And of course, I've already talked about some of the reasons why that is the case, because there are thousands of just Christian denominations, and I'm sure in other world religions, Judaism and Islam and and other sects of religious beliefs, that there are other doctrines and splinter groups as well. But as we are speaking pretty much today from a Christian perspective, that is those who follow after Christ, believe that Christ is the Son of God, that he died and that he rose again from the dead. He sent the Holy Spirit to empower us to live the the fullness of life here in the earth and granted us access to eternal life beyond this life. For those who fit into that category, then that is the unifying message. 
That is the unifying theme. You know, I always like to use the book of Acts as the prime example for the church, for the body of believers, those who follow after Christ, as I just talked about or expressed to you. The book of Acts is an ideal expression of the type of love and community that Jesus desires for his church. And when we operate in such a fashion, if you haven't visited the book of Acts lately, I pray that, that you take time this week to read through the entire book of Acts. Understand that this is after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension back into heaven to the Father, that the book of Acts gives the accounts of what happened with those who were disciples of Jesus and those who would later become apostles to take the message to other places where it had not yet been proclaimed. And, and we still live in the continuation of the church in Acts. So, saints, we, we, as you visit that, and I also wrote a booklet uh, that detailed this a little bit more called Building an Acts 2 Community, Making Disciples Not Christians. Feel free to reach out to me and get a copy of uh, that booklet. I'll be happy to share it with you. And so also some of the practical ways that we try to express and impact our world with the love of Christ is through our uh, affordable housing initiative here at Paradise Village. The village is a model village for what affordable housing looks like here in America, what community living can be like among the, the church as a model. So, so to speak, as an expression of what they did in the book of Acts, that they met from house to house, teaching prayer, breaking bread, and fellowship. Those who had much did not have too much. Those who had little did not have too little. They had all things in common. No one considered the things that they had to be their own. And you'll see these uh, ideas expressed in the book of Acts. I'm just not taking the time to open up the Bible to read the verse by verse because that's what I want you to be able to do. And so we unite spiritually. We, we, we must be united economically as they were in the New Testament church in the book of Acts. They were united uh, emotionally and socially. This is why the church in the early uh, scriptures, we're talking about biblical Christians, not the doctrinal Christians that took place after the Romans. Uh, you notice, if anyone study a little bit of what's called church history, you notice a shift from the biblical Christianity that Jesus Christ and his apostles and disciples proclaimed and the church that became an organization once the Roman emperors converted so to speak, to Christianity. It's a totally different vehicle that came out after that. And this is why we must get back to the heart of the scriptures. The book, the Bible, the, the book of Acts, the examples that's giving is the prime example of what Jesus intended, not what man intended following the Roman emperors converting to Christianity. You notice that from that point forward, every time they conquered a civilization, they forced people to accept Christianity, at least verbally, had to profess that they're believing in Christ. Whether they believed in Christ or not, they had to confess it. And the same thing played out when the Muslims conquered Christian nations. They had to profess a belief in Allah and Muhammad being his only prophet. And so... When you get into a little bit of understanding that a little bit better, you'll see how far away the church, if you want to call it that, the church as we know it today has drifted from the church as Jesus intended when he spoke the words in Matthew 16, 18, that upon this rock I will build my church. And now, now even the Catholics take that to mean that he was building his rock upon Peter. But it was Peter's confession that he is the son of the living God. This is the rock. This is the seed of truth. The bedrock of God's um, message to us. That he is the way, he is the truth, and the life. There is no other God beside him. This is the foundation and the bedrock upon which we must base our faith 
express our faith, live a life of worship in service and in good deeds and compassion and mercy and grace toward one another. So let's get comfortable with who we are and the ways we have to do that as believers is to know who you are. And the first way you know who you are is knowing who you are. Do you belong to a local church? Or do you belong to Christ? This is very central for you to examine that question for yourself because there is a difference. We can belong to a local church without belonging to the church. Christ will return for those who, be, who have his spirit in them. That is how he would separate the wheat from the chaff. So if you have received that gift of the Holy Spirit, and you are living out a, a, a submitted expression, allowing God to mold and shape you in each and every day, committed to following the ways and the teachings of Christ to the best of your ability, relying on the Holy Spirit to aid you along the path, when Christ returns, then he, that's some of the measuring rod that he would use to separate the wheat from the chaff and the sheep from the goat, as well as the sheep from the sheep, which represents other believers from other believers, because Jesus knows what makes people his, and that is the Spirit of Christ, or the Holy Spirit, living inside of us. So prayerfully, this would be some food for thought for you today as you examine being comfortable with who you are, knowing Christ, knowing yourself. Father, I thank you for allowing me this opportunity to come and share with those in the listening audience. I pray that the Holy Spirit will use my words, use these thoughts, use the scriptures as a way to draw us into a deeper level of understanding with you, a deeper understanding of you and of ourselves as we strive to live out the expression of your life to the rest of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. You've been listening to Kingdom Conversations with Bishop Lyndon Hutcherson of Amazing Grace Ministries. We were blessed that you tuned into today's message and look forward to connecting with you in person or on future podcasts. Feel free to reach out to us for more information about our ministries by visiting our website, Amazing Grace Ministries, at www.agministries.net.